live, so let me start. So, yeah. good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second week of the summer school. Uh, it's going to be another very exciting week uh, of learning and and discussions. Um, this week, we have the fortune to have Sebastian Deal uh, telling us about open quantum systems. Um, Sebastian is at the University of Cologne. Uh, he has been in Innsbruck uh, and he has um, uh, he's an expert on open quantum systems. And I mean, we were very excited to have him as a lecturer. So hopefully you all learn a lot and enjoy uh, his lectures this week. So Sebastian, thank you very much for, for accepting our invitation and please go ahead. Yeah, great, thank you, Ana Maria. I'm very pleased uh, to be here and uh, yeah, greetings from uh, cloudy, rainy Cologne. And um, yeah, indeed. So um, I got the um, invitation by, by Leo and he, he told me, okay, something Lindblad and Keldish. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, what, I, what I follow. So here I put uh, these faces are maybe not so well known, the two protagonists. And um, let's uh, directly start uh, with the outline of, uh, of the lecture. So in the first one, I would like to give you um, the theoretical background, yeah? in particular, um, we will um, start from the quantum master equation, and I will explain that a bit and then move on to the Keldish functional integral construction. And in this framework, and to get a bit used to, uh, to this language, I would like to focus today on this semi-classical limit that you can derive and how this um, Keldish action is connected to concepts like uh, Langevin equation, but also to physical systems like uh, these semicon uh, semiconductor heterostructures. And conceptually, I would like to um, in particular emphasize in which sense the physics of this quantum master equation represents a, 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 a non-equilibrium system. And so that, that will be a key conceptual point of today. And then I would like to uh, not stick around with this uh, purely formal development, but also demonstrate in one example by looking at the stationary states of this excellent polariton system, in which sense this non-equilibrium condition can give rise really to qualitative new, qualitatively new physics when you go from the microscopic scale in your problem to the macroscopic scale of, of observation, which is possible really in many problems. Now then, um, the second lecture, I would like to um, further to, on the one hand, do some further um, developments, technical developments, thinking about symmetry, symmetries and their implementation in this Keldish formalism. And physically, that will bring us uh, to um, concepts like um, topological states being stabilized by a Lindblad dynamics, focusing beyond the states on the dynamics of this problem, will derive a kind of topological field theory for, for these out of equilibrium problems. And that will really be based on, on how to process uh, symmetries in this Keldish language. And then I would like as a last point in the second lecture, connect um, these Lindblad equation to the discussion of uh, non-Hermitian topology that is now kind of pretty prominent and uprising in, in solid state physics. Now, uh, looking what this uh, Lindblad equation and uh, also, I mean, reformulated in the Keldish can tell us about that. Okay, and then there's a third uh, lecture, which, I mean, you could somehow roughly override with a Lindblad Keldish 2.0. Um, that's a development which I uh, deem pretty promising for the future, where one can use this Keldish um, path integral in a replicated uh, variant to describe the physics of quantum measurements, including in many body systems, and give us some information, for example, about this recently discussed um, measurement induced phase transitions, which I guess will also be um, covered in other uh, lectures here. So um, that said, I mean, I'm aware it's uh, quite a, a lot of material and I would really like to encourage you yeah, to slow me down anytime you feel it, it should be like that. You can also speed me up. No problem. Just uh, give me a little bit of feedback. It's your lecture. And if we somehow cut it off here or here, I don't care very much. And so I have this material. It's even online already. But uh, let's, the most important thing is really that, that you get a bit 
and not that we push push it through yeah and this is also modular so we can take this or that just let's see how it goes okay so let's start uh, with the Lindblad uh, quantum master equation and develop this from the quantum optical perspective of few level systems into a many body uh, context so what is actually a driven open quantum uh, system that's of course a concept uh, that you encounter in, in quantum optics so you have this small quantum system which is open in the sense that it may exchange uh, energy particle number or entropy with an environment yeah, with something that this small system is immersed to a bigger reservoir system that doesn't change while the system undergoes dynamics. And then the second key ingredient is that this system is driven. So you put in energy by means of classic, for example, classical fields like lasers. So let's um, make this a little more concrete with uh, one of the workhorses of quantum optics, just a two level system, which describes a laser driven atom coupled to a ray radiation field. So now in which sense is this system open? Well, here you can see that the coupling to the radiation field gives rise to spontaneous emission. And that comes, for example, with this a scale called kappa in the problem. And it is also driven in the sense that if you want this system to undergo any kind of non-entirely boring dynamics, and for you, want, you don't want it to rest just down there in the ground state, then you really have to bridge this big energy gap here and um, drive the system so to come close to a resonance, close to a second uh, excited state level. And from that um, very simple picture, so we, we really keep drive is essential to access the upper level. And that already has two very important implications, which essentially are the um, pivots of, of this lecture. First thing, there is no guarantee for detailed balance in these systems. Detailed balance would mean that the probabilities for going from one to the other level are only determined by the energetic spacing between them, which is definitely not true. You see here many more scales in the problem. And so just by counting the number of scales, it can't be a system that rests in detailed balance thermodynamic equilibrium. And the second point is maybe not that obvious from the picture, but maybe rather from this one here, there's actually no reason why the second law of thermodynamics of increasing the entropy, at least if you focus on the small subsystem here, that this has to increase because you can transfer an entropy, for example, between the system and the path. And in this system sense, you can also extract entropy from a small system. So you can construct something like a quantum fridge. And these, uh, these two points, they will kind of be the motives of, of, of the physics result I want to present. OK, so how do we then describe um, this, uh, these uh, systems here? Well, that is done by the so-called quantum master equation or Lindblad equation. And let's go through these points here. So here we look at the time evolution of a density matrix and which density matrix is that that's just really the small system density matrix and the time evolution of this uh, system density matrix is composed of a coherent evolution piece so that's for example the hamiltonian of the two level system that you have here so this object down there and then there is these um, uh, uh, these contribution that is non-hamiltonian and that describes the combined impact of drive and dissipation. So everything that acts on this small system from the outside. So as a whole thing, just to be clear about the notation, this is called um, this Lindbladian. And um, let me tell you two distinct ways, really only briefly, I have some comments on that later. And I also have an appendix where you can read about this in more detail. The derivation here is not very enlightening, so I sourced this out. Let me focus here on the physics. So um, you can one way derive this from a system bath setting. Yeah? So from a setting of this type, 
which I exemplify here with this uh, two-level system. So the starting point in this way of thinking about the problem is clearly a system bath Hamiltonian. So the system Hamiltonian in the two-level system is just uh, this Hamiltonian down there. Then you have a bath, which is a Hamiltonian that consists just of a set of bath modes, harmonic oscillators. You can take a continuum limit to describe a situation of this type. Yeah, so here's a continuum of bath modes around here and a system bath coupling where you see a linear coupling of the bath operators to some system operator L. Sebastian, a question that if, if the study is limited to very weak system environment couplings. Sorry? There is a question if this, if this study is limited to very weak system environment coupling regime. So what is the applicability of, the, of this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there is, a, so the, there is indeed um, three approximations that are, that, are, um, that are encountered here. One is this Born approximation, which essentially enables to do second order time dependent perturbation theory on this problem. So we require that this coupling G here is smaller than the other scales in the problem. That is these bath energy modes. So these are energies of this type and also bigger than the separation of these levels and much bigger than this, um, um, than this dry frequency. Yeah? So there is a hierarchy of scales and indeed you want to work at weak coupling. So to uh, ensure that you can do a second order time dependent perturbation theory, which underlies this structure that we get out here. So in that sense, yes, it is limited to weak coupling. Yeah. I, I have another comment on that, on that later on. Now, um, actually on the next slide. <laughs> so um, the other approximation is what Sebastian, is called- sorry, there is another question about- oh, um, oh, Can you explain yeah. again what the summation is for in the master equation? Uh, this summation here? Right, so that would be, um, you, you have now not, so here we have a single Lindblad operator. Yeah. Now think of two, it's, it's a very, uh, you can fill in many things. Yeah. So think of two atoms in the radiation field, then this index would run from one to two. Or think of an optical lattice yeah, where this index labels the lattice sites and these Lindblad operators here, for example, describe um, the local loss of particles out of the lattice. Yeah? So then these L operators would be something like sigma minus just in terms of a bosonic or, or fermionic annihilation operator. Yeah? And um, then if you have loss on every side in the lattice, then this would be, uh, then this would be the realization of this index. It can also describe internal states, so it's a really a, a quite a container variable. Are there any other um, questions? So it says what the, determines the structure of the driven dissipative evolution terms? This structure here? Yeah, I, I, let, let me come to this in the next slide. Yeah, it's very nice, <laughs> but you're uh, jumping ahead of, uh, of, of, of me. Yeah, here on this slide, I just wanted to let me finish it with this point, yeah? And, and again, I invite everyone to look at the appendix for the detailed derivation where I did that, yeah? Um, where we have these approximations. And the last one is actually the so-called rotating wave approximation, which tells us that this new, this drive scale new is the biggest problem, scale in the problem, yeah? So that essentially underlies these three, the combination of these three underlies the fact that we get a local in time evolution. There is no memory kernel yeah, that the dynamics remembers the history that this system underwent, but we're just looking at an update in time, which is determined by one time step before. That is um, guaranteed by these approximations. Okay, let me look at this from an alternative uh, perspective, uh, which goes uh, with which I want to answer also the question that popped up. We can alternatively think about this equation here as being derived from symmetry with which I mean here that we implement key physical re requirements that any kind of density matrix evolution should actually satisfy. Yeah? To this end, it is very useful to look at this um, 
Lindblad, uh, Lindbladian as a dynamical map, which means nothing that I, I can look at an update here in time, which is determined by the previous step and then application of this Lindblad operator. And this dynamical map, we require now a few properties which any physical evolution should obey. Yeah? Of course, it should be Hermitian, this Lindblad map, meaning that um, the density, if I start with a Hermitian density matrix, then the uh, uh, dynamical maps maps into another um, um, Hermitian density matrix. Yeah? And this property is fulfilled because this Lindblad operator, if you take a Hermitian conjugate, then indeed it, it turns out that, uh, I mean, it is Hermitian, yeah? this whole Lindblad. Yeah? So let's take this piece, for example, and make a dagger operation. So that brings me Li from this piece here then row dagger equals row and li from this here goes into li dagger. Okay, so this term is nicely Hermitian. And now you can play the same game with these two terms. They just exchange with respect to each other. And you see, okay, yes, this Lindblad is Hermitian. This Lindblad map is Hermitian in this sense. Yeah? Maps a Hermitian density operator to another one. Now then there is a second requirement, which is referred to as complete positivity. So that is the statement. Whenever my, I start at time t with a density matrix that is a positive semi-definite operator, meaning that all its eigenvalues are larger equals zero, then after one time step, it again is a, um, um, a, 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 a semi-positive, definite operator. Yeah? So this takes a little more of, of argumentation and uh, I can recommend this reference here if you want to read that. And that was actually really the, the insight of, of Lindblad himself to demonstrate this property. So that's a bit more involved to, to show. Now, uh, the third property that one might, one wants to require for a physical evolution is the preservation or the conservation of probability. Yeah? And that is nothing but the statement that the time evolution of the trace of rho should be zero. Yeah. So, and that is again the case because indeed, yeah, this piece here is clearly um, traceless. Yeah. So that's trace h rho minus rho h. Yeah. And you can, of course, under the trace use cyclic invariance to show that this vanishes. And now you can play the same game with these um, three terms in the Lindblad equation and you see, okay, also its trace vanishes. Yeah? And what, what one can say is actually that up to a unitary transformation, yeah? unitary meaning that we have here an index i, but more generally we could have this structure. Yeah? And we are essentially working in this so-called Lindblad form in the diagonal form for this, so I can use a unitary matrix to diagonalize this into this form here. And that is indeed, now the statement of Lindblad is that this equation here is the most, up to this unitary, is the most general time local generator of quantum evolution with these three characteristic properties. And Finally, I want to really connect precisely to your question, yeah, where is the structure coming from and how can I uh, somehow memorize it? Well, first of all, there are two lim occurrences of this Lindblad operators. Remember, we have something like in the system bath Hamiltonian is of that type. I do second order perturbation theory that brings me one and two operators of this type. They act in second order perturbation theory from both sides on this uh, density matrix here. That's just a structure of second order perturbation theory. And finally, how to remember that here's a two and here's a minus and another minus, that is really um, the trace preservation that tells you this. Yeah? So let me rewrite this equation a little bit and take these terms here and pull them together with, oh, and now there's an I missing, crucial I missing, and pull it together 
with the Hamiltonian. Yeah? So I just write everything with this term and one piece of this commutator, I bring it on the left side or it's on the left side of the density matrix. And now you can see, oh, what this describes is essentially energy minus I times some dissipation. Yeah? So this is called the dissipation term in this Lindlatt equation. And we said, okay, we need to ensure um, trace preservation or we need to ensure probability conservation. And for that reason, there has to be a term that compensates for the dissipation and any physical system um, dissipation must come with fluctuation to conserve probability. And that is essentially the role that this terms plays. Yeah? And I, I hope now take home message that you can really remember, oh, why is there a two? And why are there these two minus signs here? Well, that's because it ensure, or at least you can memorize it like that. That's because in this way we ensure trace preservation. Can okay. I ask you a question? Question, yeah? Um, yes, um, so you mentioned the conservation of probability, which I guess physically makes sense. But on the other hand, you mentioned that, for example, particle number can be exchanged with the bath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't I anticipate that probability is not conserved in, in certain situations? No, 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 that's not the case. I mean, in that case, what you're asking essentially can be reformulated in this language. Yeah? What about the expectation value of the operator ni. Yeah? So that I should realize as trace of this operator with big rho. Yeah? And then I just have to calculate yeah, this expectation value. I, I insert this equals trace ni and then with the whole Lindlardian. Yeah? And then I go and calculate and then I will maybe find something like gamma times n I, when there is a single particle loss. Yeah. And this I derive it from a perfectly trace preserving um, a master equation. Yeah. So what, what trace preservation is essentially this statement here, yeah. because this is trace rho. Yeah. That's trace preservation. That here tells me something about the fate of particles in the system. Yeah. And if I have a single particle loss, then I will see this here. If instead I have a single particle pump, then I will get like that and so on and so forth. And so that is not the probability conservation. So maybe another way to see it is that you, your Hilbert space has to be larger. So you cannot, if you have four, four particles, you have to include also the states with two and zero as part of your complete Hilbert space and that in order to preserve. Okay, Thanks. very good. Can I, sorry, can I also yeah. ask a question? So uh, could you repeat what you mean exactly that with uh, dissipation has to come fluctuations? This, this I didn't. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially really, uh, I, I would formulate as it's exactly this statement here. Yeah? So dissipation yeah, is, so to say, an imaginary part to energy. It's more of an interpretation question. Yeah? And it's clear yeah, if you bar out this part from the equation, then it's not consistent because that, that would not by itself would not, um, would not sort of say realize a trace preserving or probability preserving. Yeah, yeah. To, to say so understand it is, just, I mean, yeah. the thing to, to remember for you yeah, that there must be some other term and how should that look like? Well, if I just know, okay, probability needs to be preserved. And now I need to write a piece yeah, that is not describing um, decay or dissipation, then, then this year has the interpretation of fluctuation. That, that's how I would look at that. So it's a kind of interpretation of this equation. Yeah? Okay, thank you. If the, the mathematical property, the clean one is yeah. trace preservation is... probability. Sure, <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, welcome. Can I ask one clarification? You mentioned that Please. this is the only time local way, the most general, does it mean that higher corrections in L, for example, need to come associated with some form of memory kernel or um, how, well, how I think of this I mean, time I, local? You should look at it like that. I mean, these operators here are really extremely un, unspecified. Yeah? And if, if you tell me, well, uh, maybe I take L, L prime as operators, that makes it uh, um, 
L times L prime, that makes it uh, even more general than I would uh, just uh, tell you, okay, take this here as the new L. Yeah? <laughs> so it's arbitrary high order in system operators, if you like. Okay? So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a structural property. Yeah? So I, I don't tell you now what is, for example, this here seen as a function of the entire algebra of creation and annihilation operators that span the Fox space of your problem. Yeah. Okay. It's just a structural property. Okay, but I, I guess like connecting this I, to order, I mean, to you see, I mean, let's make it more concrete. Okay. That could be AI, that could be AI squared, that could be AI cube yeah, and so on. Yeah. So it's arbitrary order in the system operators as a matter of possibility. It's as general as this Hamiltonian can be, is the most general generator of purely unitary evolution, but it doesn't tell you much about how this Hamiltonian looks like. Maybe asking my question from the other side, like one of the derivatives that he mentioned, the physical one for the, this, this expression comes in, in the form of like second order perturbation theory. So I guess my question is like, if we go to higher order perturbation theory, like oh, these yeah, are yeah. But like, again, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Then, then you will produce structures with which again are of that type here. Yeah. So look at it like that. There cannot be more than a left action, a right action, and an action from two sides. Okay. There cannot be more. Yeah. So even the fourth order will be of this structure here. It may involve, for example, squares of these guys, but structurally, it's again the same thing. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So that really, it's it's a non-perturbative statement. That's why I really insist some of these are alternative ways of looking at the problem. One gives you some of the intuition, oh, why is this a driven system? The other one gives you the structural form of this time local update of a density matrix. Yeah? But it's a, it's a very good question. Yeah? Awesome, thank you. Okay, very good. So now we have, um, <clears throat> looked at a um, uh, few degrees of freedom, namely essentially, at least in this um, physical the way of deriving it, yeah, namely at these, um, um, we looked at the um, two level system. And now the question is now what happens if we replace these few degrees of freedom indeed by many degrees of freedom. And essentially it comes back to this question that was asked initially, what's this index I? So now we are looking at a situation where this index i really labels for us the sides, say, in a lattice system or even the degrees of freedom in a spatial continuum. Yeah? And that brings us then to this interface of quantum optics and many body physics, where the ingredient from quantum optics is, of course, that we have a coherent and driven dissipative dynamics on an equal footing in the sense precisely of this equation here. But on the other hand, we realize this index here really by a continuum of spatial degrees of freedom. Yeah? And this is a pretty new combination of, of things. Yeah? And it allows us to, so to say, go from the microphysics scales to the macrophysics scales in the sense of asking questions of that time. Yeah? So we can even ask in this sense now for out of equilibrium systems, the statistical mechanics question. So what are the phases of that system? What are the phase transitions and so on? Yeah. So that is uh, now sort of the, the goal of these lectures to develop this a little bit. And um, the platforms yeah, in which such circumstance is realized and, and we'll see in more detail in which sense precisely this is realized are really numerous. For example, in the context of atoms I mean, uh, one of the first realizations of such a driven open many body system was uh, in the Esslinger group, where they looked at this Bose Einstein condensate in a cavity, an entire Bose Einstein condensate immersed into an optical cavity, uh, subject to, to a drive and, and dissipation, which actually stabilizes two condensate modes, not only a single one, as in the usual BEC. And um, the interplay between the light and, um, and, and the the light and the matter degrees of freedom realizes actually something that is known as the Dicker model. So one of the paradigmatic uh, models of, um, of, of condensed matter physics, which in particular here realizes a, a driven open variant of this model. 
Yeah, another uh, platform are, for example, these Rydberg gases in the driven dissipative regime. For example, in these works here, we've uh, seen that this realizes a phenomenon. Yeah, so these driven Rydberg gases can realize a phenomenon known as self-organized criticality. Now, um, with a light degrees of freedom, you can also realize that light is really the, the basic uh, driving forces, for example, in this micro cavity waste. So these are all small resonators down here where light is confined and it can hop from one to another of these cavities. You can induce nonlinearities, for example, Karen nonlinearities, and realize a, a Bose Hubbard model in this way. Or, and that's a platform that we'll focus on a bit in this lecture, the so-called exciton polariton systems. I'll say later more about it, but that's again a platform in, in, in solid state, or that's a solid state platform uh, where you have a strong hybridization again between light and matter degrees of freedom. So rule of thumb, whenever light is an important degree of freedom, the, the particle number of de degrees of freedom involving light is never conserved, you need to pump this back and that realizes a kind of flux equilibrium. Now, more recently, I mean, I find this a, a, a key, a very interesting development, these NIST platforms, yeah, also in view of what I would like to tell you about tomorrow, um, about these measurement induced phases and phase transition. So, so these are really um, artificial quantum systems under extremely high control, really somehow single particle or single constituent addressability that's somehow even better than in, in, in these platforms. And there's been a recently a fascinating progress in this superconducting circuits and in Rydberg tweezers realizing topological codes or, uh, and I think you heard about this by Antoine, at least about this Rydberg tweezers and maybe by Chris Monroe, you will hear about um, the trapped iron platform also in the context of this measurement. Okay, so with this, yeah, um, we are ready now to formulate what's the challenges to theory. Of course, uh, we want to discover some new um, phenomena and in particular here, we'll be concerned with yeah, how actually to connect the microscopic level of physics where we know things are governed by a master equation down to the long wavelength um, description of that system. And that all has to work now in the absence of familiar concepts like a free energy and its minimization principles. That is the realm of equilibrium condensed matter theory. Now we have to work a little harder to find a framework, and that's the next point now, in order where we can describe um, these physics more systematically. And let me introduce here what I would term uh, Lindblad phi to the four theory. So if you heard a little bit about, uh, about field theory, and so we have a phi four uh, theory as a workhorse for developing all kinds of um, theoretical tools. And now here is the corresponding model for a Lindblad equation. So that's now really composed of a many body system where we now fill all these objects with a little life. Namely for the Hamiltonian, we just take kinetic energy and a chemical potential a rotating frame and we give it uh, some two particle elastic collisions. That's what this Hamiltonian describes here. Then we will expose this to a single particle pump. Yeah, you can see I feed the many body system from above and I create particles at each instance in space here with a rate gamma pump. I also open up this system and let particle being lost. Yeah, so here we have a single particle loss again at any side X in the system at any position. And uh, with this comes with a great, great gamma loss. And I mean, to kind of create the analog of the two particle interactions, I also want a two particle loss in this problem. Yeah? So here, two particles at one position in space, they get lost as a pair. Okay, and the plan is now to take this workhorse Lindbladian here and go through a one-to-one -one mapping from this many body master equation into an equivalent a Keldish functional integral. And then here I formulate a few questions that maybe you can keep in mind for this journey. So first of all, I would like to demonstrate later on how this 
microscopic model, which maybe still looks a little theoretical, how that connects precisely to these exciton polariton systems. Yeah? So here we learn conceptually the concept of what is known as a semi-classic limit of this quantum Keldish functional integral. So that's a really key uh, formal development that we'll also need later stages of the lecture. Then I would like to really make more precise in which sense the system realizes out of equilibrium conditions which are not compatible with thermal equilibrium. So we cannot use free energy. And then uh, by example, I would like to um, go and extract uh, the phase structure or some long wavelengths. What's the physics of these problems at long wavelengths by some hopefully interesting example. Okay. So that brings me then to this Keldish functional integral uh, construction. And um, to do this, to start this, maybe uh, you ask yourself the question, so why should I do that at all? Yeah, I mean, and um, can I not, I have a formulation of this problem. I can describe it in terms of the master equation. So why would I work uh, to, to get an alternative description? And to this end, I just would like to read this uh, motivation of Feynman, yeah, who reformulated quantum mechanics in terms of the path integral. And that is the formulation is mathematically equivalent to the more usual formulations. There are therefore no fundamentally new results. However, there is a pleasure in recognizing old things from a new point of view. And <laughs> also there are problems for which this new point of view offers a distinct advantage. Yeah, so I very much sympathize with this point of view. That is just a pleasure to re rewrite it, but um, I want to convince you that it's also a very useful and uh, there is some distinct advantages. Yeah? So when is this usual, useful just as a, a starting point? It's useful, uh, this quantum field theory is a use for which in the Keldish framework is always useful when we deal with systems with many degrees of freedom. And for example, then uh, you can use uh, the diagrammatic perturbation theory. Maybe you know that from your Q courses, courses on QFT. You can also, I mean, you have a very flexible choice in, in designing your the variables in which you want to describe uh, your system. Yeah? For example, the long wavelength physics might be encoded in very different the variables and the microscopic one, think of phonons in the BC, BC versus atomic creation and annihilation operators, and also a concept, uh, the concept of the randomization group comes in, where I wouldn't know how to do that on a master equation. Now, uh, more specifically, so that's generally for field theory, more specifically to Keldish, it is really, as you will see, much, much closer to the real-time formulation of quantum mechanics. And I, I think it gives you really a grip on real-time dynamics much better than the imaginary time functional integral of um, thermodynamic equilibrium does. It also gives you directly, as we'll see, that observable quantities in terms of response and correlation functions. It's simply without um, a much um, rivalry in, uh, in, in cases like when we have to describe dissipation and out of equilibrium system and generally well, it opens up this field. So I hope that is some motivation to uh, keep you uh, awake now. Yeah, so and now uh, we want to go into this construction. So this construction consists of three steps. Yeah? I, and I, I first give you these three steps and then we go into the details. So the first, first thing you should realize is, okay, the Schrödinger equation, that is the state evolution of a state vector. And the key word is now vector. Yeah? So that means I can integrate it in this way. And this is really just a unitary acting, a unitary transformation on a state vector. Let's look at the Heisenberg von Neumann equation. What are we doing there? Well, we are evolving not a vector, we are evolving a matrix. Yeah? So the Heisenberg von Neumann equation, which is actually the non-dissipative part of the Lindblad equation, 
That is sort of this kind of transformation. And I can also formally solve this equation by noting yeah, that I have a matrix evolution. So I need to act on the left on the density matrix with a unitary U in the case of this Heisenberg von Neumann and on the right with a unitary which comes with U dagger. Yeah. In particular, you, you may notice that when we are really dealing with exclusively pure states, then, I mean, this is essentially evolving two copies, namely of Psi and of Psi dagger. Yeah? So the, what, what this equation here describes. And now we just do this very simple uh, jump and realize that the uh, master equation is also in this class of matrix evolving um, of, of, of a matrix evolution. Yeah? It may be a little more uh, formal, yeah? but we have here something that is an evolution that is linear in the state. And we have the action of a, what is called super operator. One example of the super operator is this special case where we have two unitaries acting from left and right. But I'll, you'll see in a second again, how this is operationally extremely well-defined in the sense of a trotter, trotter, uh, trotter evolu uh, decomposition of this object here. And then we understand the key message here is matrix evolution. And now we want to formulate this as a part in the graph, this matrix evolution. Okay, and now again, as I said, yeah, with this kind of uh, mindset, we now go through steps one, two, three. So step number one allows me to directly introduce this idea of the functional integral. And the functional integral idea really relies on this rotter decomposition of the unitary Hamilton evolution. So how you should think about that, uh, this is here the trotter identity. Yeah? When I choose delta t in this way, and I take the limit n to infinity, I produce precisely this exponential matrix. Yeah? Now, what the path integral does is at each of these instances, at each of these instances, I insert a bunch or a representation of unity in terms of coherent states. Okay, so at each of these instances, I will now insert um, um, a full set of coherent states. So let's now concentrate on one of these time steps here. Okay, that is done here. So at this side, uh, or at this point in time, so this is really running time here. Yeah, and it's, uh, so this is this evolution. And at these instances, I insert these resolutions of, uh, of identity. And in the middle of it stands this small update under the unitary transformation H, yeah, or e to the i delta th. Okay, so let's look at this blue thing here in terms of a matrix element. Yeah? So I'm, I'm really focusing on the brackets here and you can see that is what comes out and I've taken into account in particular the normalization that is hidden here in these coherent states. Okay, now how to do with this matrix element? Now we can use the smallness of this delta T, remember this relation here, to expand this to first order, yeah, that's fine when delta t goes to zero. And then we use the properties of coherent states, this one here, that an operator acting on a coherent state uh, to the right brings out this um, eigenvalue of the coherent state. Yeah? So when my Hamiltonian is normal ordered, so something like takes this structure and not this structure, so that is not normal ordered, that is normal ordered. Yeah? So everyone annihilating to the left, uh, sorry, to the right, then I can act with this operator on this coherent state, with this operator to this, and then I get the Hamiltonian operator replaced by a Hamiltonian function of these complex variables for both sides. Okay. And then I simply can re-exponentiate this, this thing here, again, using the smallness of delta t to write it in terms of this object here. Yeah? And now uh, you can see here a uh, Hamiltonian and you can see one more piece here, which in the continuum limit, well, this delta t goes into a dt, a temporal increment. This object that has emerged here goes into time derivative times phi, yeah? 
and the Hamiltonian goes into a continuous function of these t's. There is a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. Just uh, it may be a dumb question, but I, I'm just wondering why are we using coherent states here? Uh, the, the reason is um, exactly in this formula. Yeah? So we want to get rid of the operatorial character of the Hamiltonian yeah? and replace it by a more kind of, if you like, classical object, yeah? namely these, uh, these coherent state eigenvalues. Yeah? And you, you'll then see that the, the evolution under a Hamiltonian operator goes into a big integral over phase space variables, if you like, yeah? namely phi and phi star, which is something like x and p, yeah? phase space variables. And we are reducing the operatorial formulation of, of quantum mechanics yeah? into a much more classical way of thinking about the problem, namely over uh, as an integral over phase space. Yeah? And kind of the fluctuating character of these, these quantum mechanical operators is picked up by the huge integrations over phase space, which exhausts all classically available contributions okay. or all available contributions, not only the classical path of an action, but all configurations that the system might take. So not only the classical okay. configurations. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. thanks. Can I ask a follow up? More questions. Uh, in, in this context, like how, like, is this language specific for bosons? I assume it also works for fermions. What if we have spins? Does one have to change this formalism? Yes, uh, I have uh, prepared an appendix precisely for that. Yeah, so the, um, this structural property, yeah, namely the, the existence of coherent states is not limited to bosons. You can also formulate that for fermions. It gives you uh, some updates in the formulation because you have this property that uh, some bosonic complex numbers obey this um, relation here. While if you have what is called Grassmann numbers, so the eigenvalues yeah, of A, firm, A is a fermion now on state parameterized with eta, which is this uh, coherent eigenstate of fermions, then these guys here, they actually anti-commute. Yeah. J. That's a very distinct property, but otherwise, I mean, except for a few physically crucial signs, the technology works exactly the same. And I've exactly um, taken this into account in the appendix. There is a subtlety, and I invite everyone in formulating the master equation or the, the Keldish integral for that, you can look it up in the, in the appendix. So, I, I have, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a follow up on the coherent state part. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so what you really need is that th there was sort of an equation in the box below of the previous page. You want a set of uh, eigenest states that uh, you know preserve those properties, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I use a generalized coherent state, it still would be work. So, so like a non-linear. Uh, in which sense generalized coherent state? So I mean, I can define a general A, not necessarily just a little A, that uh, has the same property. Uh, they call it generalized coherent states or non-linear coherent states. And uh, they have same resolution of identity, same thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I'm wondering, for example, a squeeze the states, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So can I use a set of squeezes states for this? Uh, I, I would say um, it's not necessary. <laughs> so let's let's take the, the principle of, of minimal action <laughs> seriously and just do what we need to do. Yeah? So <laughs> we, we have uh, formulated our problem in terms of this canonical algebra on, on, uh, on Fox space, yeah? or we have a set of creation annihilation operators. Yeah? And uh, to get those into complex or Grassmann valued numbers, we need no more than these uh, coherent states in the sense I use that. If you are asking, are we able in this framework to describe phenomena like squeezing? The answer yes. is clearly yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, you, you should not, uh, so to say, confuse the, 
the potential of describing something with, so to say, the possibility of formulating in this or that way. I think that's the important one. Yeah. I see. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, good. Okay, very well. So now um, we are in the position, yeah, when we repeat this procedure, yeah, so now we move, we have discussed in detail one of these blocks and we've seen that this gives me the structure DT. So that gives me essentially this density in time of this uh, update on the density matrix. And now I take a big product of all these steps, one and so on, yeah, and I get this in the exponent, yeah, these products, they sum uh, the product of exponents, sum in the, expo in the exponent. And I produce also, this is what I was speaking about, this integral over entire phase space at each instance in time. So it's a huge integration here. And that defines me what is known as this functional integral measure. Okay. So the operator here, that was the main point, went from a Hamiltonian operator into a complex time-dependent functional H. Um, the time evolution operator, so this piece here, recall that was coming essentially from this neighboring um, states here. So it's a good idea to really go through this maybe later on for yourself. And um, there is actually no reference now that I had to use uh, whether this is a, so the, the key construction here is how to deal with the time coordinate, not so much uh, whether there's one degree of freedom, one oscillator say, or infinitely many. Yeah? So it's in the formulation, that's essentially the same thing. And um, so far, yeah, we've really looked at this single um, um, branch yeah, over which we were evolving the system in extent of a vector evolution. Now comes point number two. Yeah? Let's look instead of the Schrödinger at the Heisenberg von Neumann equation. Okay. So now we have to repeat the idea of this functional integral on the left of the density matrix and on the right. And how do we do that? Well, I have a trick now. I insert my coherent states here and there. And I will label those, just give them a label. I, I call these here, I index them with a, with a plus. Yeah, my coherent states phi plus. And the guys that appear on the right, I label them with coherent states phi minus. So this gives me a two branch structure that is necessary whenever I want to describe mixed state evolutions. Yeah? So take home message, we get here two sets for uh, two sets of degrees of freedom for this matrix evolution. Okay, and now we do this little leap yeah, of saying, well, the quantum master equation is exactly of that type. Yeah? I can formally, because it's a linear in row equation here, I can formally integrate that. And what's the meaning of this exponentiated object? Well, operationally, that's in exactly the sense of the product evolution. Yeah? I can think of this time integrated thing that is really a little implicit as a concatenation of many steps of this Lindblad operator applied to the density matrix. And we know yeah, how this L acts in a single time step and a single time step, how it acts on row. And that is exactly nothing but this expression here. Okay. So I can now repeat this idea of this path integral construction all on just on both sides of the density matrix, where in each time step, I imply this Lindblad operator to the density matrix. Okay, and now the final step, yeah, whenever we want to do some statistical mechanics, some many body problem, we want to construct a partition function. Yeah, and that we do it yeah, by wiring up this evolution. Yeah? I just take, I, here's a starting point. I pull it out. This is time evolving the system. And now I glue together these two ends here. And that is exactly mathematically what is done by doing a trace operation. Yeah? By a trace operation, I take the outer indices of a matrix and identify some over it. So that's the trace operation. And that gives now rise to what is known as this Keldish contour structure yeah, where we have a plus contour and a minus contour. Recall 
the minus contour, it's where I inserted the coherent states on the right of the density matrix, the other one on the left. And that is, so to say, what gives me this Keldish partition function. Now, you can say one thing that is really very stupid because it's just a representation of unity. <laughs> yeah? Because of probability conservation and noting that trace rho naught, yeah, if we have a sensibly normalized density matrix is nothing but one, and then dt trace rho equals zero, yeah, that tells me immediately that trace rho of t is one as well. And that is now what we want to sell as the Keldish partition function. The answer is yes, that's what we want to do. Yeah? We want to pull the time from minus infinity to plus infinity and represent this object as a path integral. So I come to in a second what this still helps us to extract information about the theory. Let me first come to the final result of this construction and yeah, just to tell you the structure of what is coming out in this construction. So we started from the Lindblad equation with this left and right action on the density matrix. And we have now formulated this in terms of this Keldish partition function where the Keldish action, so the thing that stands here in the exponent, bracket missing, um, is this object here. So here we see this time derivative term that came in from the normalization of the, um, from the normalization of the, of the coherent states. And see that we have here, look, this thing occurring on both sides of the density matrix with a relative minus sign is u and u dagger. And then there is this Lindbladian functional, yeah, which has this structure. Now you see H plus. Yeah? So this is the Hamiltonian operator, which exclusively depends on fields that are sitting on this plus contour, on this contour, minus a Hamiltonian, which exclusively sits on the minus contour. And that is now really exactly these correspondences that you should see. Yeah. Similarly, for this Lindbladian, whenever there is a Lindbladian on the plus contour, that was someone who acted from the left onto the density matrix, while if it sits on the minus contour, that was one guy that came from the minus contour. Yeah? And you can do these connections here exactly in this way. Okay? So that's, that's how so to say, in the operatorial formulation, this left and right action on the density matrix is reflected by the emergence of an additional index in this Keldish functional integral, which is called this plus and minus contours. And you really recognize by, by following all these strings here, you really recognize this Lindblad structure. So in summary, this gives us a neat and simple translation table um, between um, the, the, the master equation the master equation and this uh, action formulation, an operator right of the density matrix goes onto the minus contour left of the density matrix on the plus contour. Okay, let's now um, come to the question about this uh, trace or probability preservation. Yeah, that's a neat uh, feature. How does this show up in this Keldish formulation? Yeah? Well, we start from the quantum master equation here, this trace rho equals zero is the cyclicity of the, um, of the um, trace operation. In the Keldish, we have here this, this property. And now, how do I see the uh, cyclic property in this Keldish action formulation? Yeah? So how do I see it from the structure of this action? Well, taking the cyclic property under the trace, means that I can move operators, at least in a cyclic way, around as I like them. Yeah? So in other words, that means forgetting about, do I sit right or do I sit left on the density matrix in the master equation? Yeah? So that's this cyclic exchange property. But that, that tells me an interesting uh, property, namely taking the trace is formally the same as forgetting about this index plus or minus. So in other words, if I identify yeah, 
the plus and minus indices, then I should see that this Keldish action actually vanishes yeah? for, for um, phi plus equals phi plus. Yeah? So, so this is a function of, of plus and minus, but if I identify them, then I should get zero. And that reflects the trace preservation. It's a property that, that we'll encounter later at the moment. It's maybe not yet so visible why, why this is important. Okay, good. Let me now come back to this question. Yeah? Z equals trace rho of t equals one. Yeah? So why is it still meaningful to do such a construction if we are doing nothing but representing unity? Well, that is because it gives us the possibility of acquiring information about correlation functions in the system. There's a question. Karsha, go, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was wondering if uh, about your last slide, actually. So the, the functional integral that you've written, uh, it gives you the, I mean, at least naively the way I understand it, it gives you the partition function, right? Is there a way to actually get um, rho of tf by some functional integral, by some functional integral that has you know specific boundary conditions or something like that. Um, the, you mean if you can use this formula? Let me try to reformulate whether you can use this formulation to study dynamic problems. Yes, something that like that. I mean, yeah. we have to we have to define a bit the question. So th these lectures here they are mainly about stationary states of driven open quantum systems. Yeah? And then we are happy to move time to plus and minus infinity. Yeah? And then it's exactly this slide, yeah? we will ask questions, how is this field here inserted at position T correlated with a field inserted at uh, T prime, yeah? but in a stationary state. So this is what is called a dynamical correlation function, yeah? something like phi plus T phi minus of t prime, that is called, that is what you can compute here. That's a dynamical correlation function that makes sense even in stationary state. The only point of stationary state is that it's then only a function of t minus t prime. Yeah? So these are dynamical properties, but in stationary state is the main focus of this lecture here. If you are asking now the question, well, is it also possible yeah, to look at dynamic as a, really a time evolving problems in this framework. Yeah? And the answer is, is also yes, yeah? but then you have to really look at, I think then in some sense, the master equation is then the, the better framework. I mean, what I can also tell you that people are working with this uh, Keldish functional integrals to uh, study, for example, questions like thermalization or turbulence problems of this type. So the statement is you can, but we won't do it here, but you can also, you don't only have to look at, you can look beyond stationary problems also at dynamical evolutions, yeah, it's possible, but it's not the center of interest here. Yeah. See, thank you. Okay, further questions? Yes, you have two, two hands raised there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Uh, so it's, uh, let me, I don't see the names. I see Ioan Kiandru. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So Sebastian, maybe I'll ask, uh, if you could go back to the previous slide. So can you unpack, I came in a little late, so maybe you've made the definitions already. The, you know, but even if you have defined them in the context of, in the formulation of the mass, quantum master equation, it'd be nice mm -hmm. to have the L's defined in terms of the phi fields at the level of the yeah, Keldish. Yeah. So I mean, is that I something you've already stated? It'd be I nice understand. at that point to summarize what it is, just because it's otherwise it's not fully defined. No, no, no. It, it is. I think it they is are general. Yeah. They are general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where well, I mean, so so these are all these L structures. Yeah? So this is one L. Yeah. So that's really a creation operator. Then okay. So, it's, at, so that's that's a kind of what I call then a five fourth Lindblad five fourth. Yeah. Okay. So, because we're going up to fourth order so this, and operators. And so operators. the simplest, you're saying the simplest L is just the phi itself. It's the phi itself, yeah. It's the phi or the phi dagger. So if it's the phi, then it's a single particle loss. If it's the phi dagger, then it's a single particle pump. If it's also a phi square, it's a two particle loss. Yeah? 
And you mm -hmm. see that sums up to four operators in total. So that's somehow the, um, the analog, and that's why I call it five fourth. Uh, that's the analog of a elastic collision is now right. a two bot particle loss. You could also, in addition, look at a two particle pump. But, uh, yeah. I see. Okay. Okay, so that's what you mean, okay. Um, but is there some, yeah, okay, I guess you're building in processes that, you know, whatever the system you're considering, you, you have to think about what processes are allowed. Uh, and so then that identifies for you what the L's are. Absolutely, I mean, that formulating this microscopic Lindblad equation yeah, is just as uh, hard or easy as formulating the microscopic Hamiltonian. Yeah? So you have to, that's definitely not just uh, some symmetry input, yeah? but <laughs> it, you, you have to know about the, really the dynamics of the problem. Yeah? I, I want to somewhat channel in later on, on, on so to say, when you just have maybe knowledge about symmetries, what can you then still say? But again, so let's take the L where it's just a phi. So the process you have in mind is that the, you have an open system and that corresponds to the process where a particle leaves the cavity or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that okay. single particle loss, yeah, it could be, I mean, with atoms, yeah, it's clear that there are constraints. Yeah, you only have three particle loss, but um, so dynamic kinematic constraints, but for, for cavities, I mean, for, for, for polaritons, yeah, whenever, as I said in the beginning, whenever you have light as a constituent in your creation and annihilation operators because there's some hybridization going on, then you clearly always have a single particle loss in the problem. And you need right. to you do some many body physics with it, something interesting, not only transient, yeah, you need to replenish this and pump uh, light in. And so, so this hybrid part mm -hmm. is in. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. And now the question. Yeah, Andrew. Is, yeah um, I, I think my, my question is just um, why aren't we using like the time ordering uh, exponential when we're doing it? Is that because we just assume H is a constant? Yes, yes. Th that okay, is, okay. I, I looked at a time independent Hamiltonian. But the, the okay. nice thing is, I mean, if you work with where's the formula? Um, if you work with something like that with this trotter, yeah, so let's maybe do it more simply. Yeah? So, so um, yeah, this time ordering yeah, of, of this thing here, which is complicated, you can of course define it as really the product over all times yeah. at one minus I delta T H of some time T. Yeah? That's, uh, that is a time ordering. <laughs> okay, so, so even when we are, um, okay, so even if like uh, the Lindblad DN is, I guess time dependent. We we still if, don't need to worry about. Now that. we're looking at time independent generators. Yeah? So no, no, but okay. I mean, I mean, path integral automatically gives you time order. So oh, that's by a different story. That's by, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that relates to the incapacity of a of a functional integral to really faithfully represent the the, the, the kind of operator ordering. That's the reason mm -hmm. why the correlation functions that you compute from a say from a single time in um, single contour path integral is always time ordered. That's true. Yeah? So that's the right. only way to rip. You can only represent time order correlation functions. Exactly. Single contour path okay. Integral. Okay. Now with these yeah. two contours, you can also represent anti time ordered and mm. more uh, fancy objects. Yeah. And actually we'll also touch upon this point. It's, it's, it's getting the, the tech to the technical side, but I can. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So where are we? Uh -huh. Physical observables, right? So so now so uh, coming back, yeah. Why is this here um, still interesting? Although we are representing something trivial. Well, because we can in this way generate correlation functions between, say, two points in time, yeah? and that's especially useful yeah, when we take this time, initial time, and final time just to infinity. Then we can interrupt or the system at any time t and t prime and get information about that. So how is this done technically? How to compute them? Well, we just, as we know from statistical mechanics, we can introduce, introduce these sources and we define essentially a sourced partition function as the big expectation value with respect, essentially this, this is uh, with respect to this phi and then everything that stands in here weighted with this Keldish action. Yeah? 
So that's what these brackets here mean. And that's the operator expectation or the, the field expectation value that we study. And now what does this help? Well, we can just take the variation of derivatives to produce these kind of correlation function that, oh, that was one on the previous pages have yeah, precisely this correlation function. We can produce it by taking the second derivative here in exactly this way. Now I agree with you. So, so that's first of all settling, okay, we can have access to these correlation functions, but now I should uh, tell you what do these guys mean? Oh, and actually this should be of course plus. So what, what do they mean? Yeah. And that brings us to this discussions or uh, to this discussion of correlation versus response functions. Yeah, that's a little bit on the dry side of this lecture, but I think it's useful to, to have this uh, to go through that. So if you think about it in physics, there's really two ways of two, or two classes of experiments. One are these correlation measurements where you study the physics without disturbing it. That is, for example, taking here this quantum cavity, not putting in any light from the outside, not, not driving it and just looking what's the output of it. Yeah? So that is kind of, uh, you get information on how is this cavity occupied yeah, or on this, um, um, for example, G1 of tau function. Yeah? So the other way of getting information about the system is to hit it. Yeah, and see how it re reacts. Yeah? So that is this class of response or linear response in particular is the simplest thing to do, linear response measurement. You probe the system by a weak external field. For example, now you look at some coherent input field into the cavity, you let it go through and you look in the end at linear order yeah, in, in this perturbation here, how does the system react? Yeah? And um, the fun point is, or the interesting point about this Keldish functional integral is that it directly delivers you the correlation and the response functions upon a small formal trick, namely a change of basis in these contour coordinates. So recall we have introduced this plus and minus coordinates and I now pass over by a unitary transformation to something like a center of mass coordinate, this guy here, and a relative coordinate. Yeah, so yeah, I really can think about it as a center of mass and relative. Now let's go through the properties that these um, uh, fields may have. So this, what is called the, the classical field, that's called for the reason that it can acquire a finite expectation value. For example, if you have lasing in the problem, you have a occupied manifold occupied cavity mode, or if you have a Bose condensation going on, then you get a finite expectation value for this field. Okay. And while this, what is called the quantum or the relative coordinate, that takes the difference between these things. And we then have now what's the expectation value of the quantum field? plus minus phi minus, but as we've seen, yeah, so what this plus and minus is not physically distinct objects, it's just in the representation of this problem. So clearly the expectation value on this uh, contour and on that contour, they should be the same. So this here equals a fat zero. The expectation value of this quantum field, because this plus and minus is essentially a redundancy in the description of this matrix evolution here that should have expectation value zero. Okay. So that is uh, what one can say about this classical and quantum fields. And let me also note that this property of probability preservation, so meaning that if we identify plus and minus indices, that is of course the same identifying plus and minus indices is of course the same as setting this quantum field here to zero. And so the statement was, when I look at this Keldish action, I set the quantum field to zero. That's a really nice um, benchmark. Then I should get zero. Otherwise something went wrong. Okay, now um, let's come back to this uh, correlation and response functions. 
And I just reformulate this partition function from the plus and minus basis into this new basis. Yeah? And I do this basis transformation now for the phi and for the source fields. Okay? Now, um, what can we do with this? So I can, for example, um, compute the expectation value of this deterministic field, of this occupation field, if you like, by taking a first derivative with respect to the quantum field. Yeah, you can see it here, this quantum field, the quantum source coupled to this classical field. So by taking a first variation, I just get the occupation of this field mode by classical. Okay. Now I can ask about the response. So that, that's a kind of correlation property. Yeah? So I have not disturbed the problem at all. I just ask, so how is this mode here occupied? Now let me look at a response. Yeah? Let me now hit this problem really with a classical field. Yeah? With, I really wiggle, for example, the input of the cavity. And then I look how to linear order in J, in, in this source here, how to linear order does this correlation factor or this occupation function, how does it change yeah? to linear order? And if I look, okay, at this definition, well, that brings me down one of these quantum fields. Yeah? And that is what is called the response function or the retarded response function that takes the form of, um, of a Correlator in the in this Keldish um, path integral phi classical times phi quantum star, and you can once and for all convince yourself that this relates to the operatorial formalism in this way. And so that's a bit of calculation. You can find it in this review here. And maybe if you want to look at that. Now let's look at the single particle correlation function. Yeah, with this, while well, here we asked how does a system react to external perturbations. Now we can ask how are states occupied? Yeah? And that defines, yeah, so that, that defines what is known as this Keldish Green's function. So we just pull another instance of this phi C's down yeah, by taking another derivative with respect to this quantum source. Yeah? So I just by taking one more derivative here, I'm producing this, um, this object here. And um, you can see that what is exchanged here is just quantum and classical index. If I do the relation to the operator formalism here, I can see that this course, while this here corresponded to the commutator of fields, this here corresponds to the anti-commutator. And in particular, if you look at this at equal time and equal position in space, then this is nothing, this anti-commutator is nothing but the occupation, the particle number expectation value this state. We'll go through an example in a second, so to make this a bit more graspable. Yeah? And then you can assemble the total Keldish Green's function. It has this entry here, so it's just a way of organizing it in this classical and quantum two by two space, so in the contour space, if you like, where we have this Keldish Green's function, we have this retarded Green's function, and together with the retarded Green's function, comes an advanced Green's function, so-called advanced Green's function, which is just by, obtained by emission conjugation. So I agree, this is a bit the dry part of the lecture, but it's on the other hand, also really on the core of, of uh, what one has to know and do a little bit of calculation. So let's zoom in and make it more concrete, this general discussion by a concrete example. Okay, and as a concrete example, I want to look at the arguably simple most um, driven open system, just uh, the master equation for a decaying cavity. So I and think here, that I have something, yeah. in, so I mean, the Kelly formulation is also for Hamiltonian evolution. So mm -hmm. how, what is the, I mean, the, the protocol that you describe is, is generic. It's not only for open systems, but for any type of system. And you're just going to apply specifically for an open system. That that's. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, if you want to reduce it to the Hamiltonian problem, then just drop out. You said problem. kappa to zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just you have to be a bit careful because then the integration is not uh, well defined. Yeah. So this functional integration, you have to introduce a small regularization yeah, to make this actually problem well defined. 
And uh, that is somehow automatic in, in this dissipative system. Yeah? What you would do is essentially to, to introduce an I epsilon prescription. Yeah? And this I epsilon is precisely somehow pick, picking up this uh, an infinitesimal okay. coupling to a path if you want to. Okay. Okay, okay. So that's why I like some of these open systems. This this uh, regularization doesn't doesn't show up much, and so it's automatically built in. And I we see. will later see how this connects actually to thermal equilibrium. Great, great, and and just also, I mean, remember uh, there are there are remaining five six minutes to the end of the yes, lecture. Yes. So <laughs> I mean, I'm not even <laughs> anywhere I wanted to yeah. be, but it's great. Yeah? So, I, so I hear a lot of questions. So I think that's the whole point of it yes but Here, one i would actually is, really now yes, why is this one question that really? you have that i have is is you want to is this is this example going to take six minutes or is better to uh, stop here uh, and this start is yeah, i think this yeah yeah this I'll, I'll manage this and yeah okay great i think yeah i, I can conclude this and um yeah yeah very well okay so, okay great mm -hmm. uh okay um, right, and it also I, I want to conclude this. Yeah? So this is the last uh, dry part, and tomorrow we. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Okay, so this I really want you to do this as a small exercise. Yeah? I would like you to to go via this general path integral construction. I want you to derive this action here, yeah? and you see I've done this transformation to okay. Classically should be a C yeah? to classical fields and quantum fields. I would like you to produce this action here and then by Fourier transformation this. Now I just say, okay, that's what you should get. So this is formulated in the time domain and this is in the free frame domain. Now I want to ask the question and answer the question, how are these correlation and response functions that we constructed really on how does the system respond and how are the states occupied? How does this relate to the objects that enter the Keldish action? And the statement is anticipated here. Let me um, define this kernel of the Keldish action as already with, with, with foresight as g to the minus one, where g would be the Green's function of this problem. So this g, k, g, r, g, a, collecting together correlation and response functions. Yeah? So how to see that? OK. For this simple quadratic problem, yeah, I can actually compute the exact partition function for the object simply by completing the square. Yeah. I just um, um, look at the definition of this in terms of the Keldish path integral. I complete the square and I will find this object. Again, please verify this. Yeah. It's a simple but very, very fruitful exercise. And the main point about this completion of the square is that this, what I said, is the inverse Green's function shows up here now as what is called then the Green's function. Yeah. Okay, and then I know what to do. I can compute the single particle Green's function, which is defined as the collection of the occupation uh, of the fields of the um, retarded response of the advanced response and of this guy here. I can just get it by um, acting with the suitable variational derivatives. And when I do it on this object here, well, I, then I produce these correlators. Yeah? So if I act on this side of the equation, if instead I act on the result, so I go down here, then I see ah, by twice varying with respect to this field as prescribed here, I get down indeed this Green's function. Yeah? So this justifies and that's now the important point. It's written very small, but it's very important. The action matrix kernel. So this object, which I defined as g to the minus one, which has these entries here, p a, p r, p k, is the inverse Green's function. That's a very important technical property that we want to. And here I summarize again the technical, so the properties that these objects have. OK. Now let's look at now uh, giving you really a bit of intuition. What are the responses versus the correlation? So let's look at some specific observables for this quantum cavity. And let's start with the response. For example, 
the single particle response function, so this retarded green function here, I can get it from the um, frequency domain yeah, that we computed on the previous page as the inverse of this entry here. I just Fourier transform this. Yeah, so that's gr to the minus one. I Fourier transform this and I get this structure here. Oh, that's clear. Yeah, I have some oscillation. Oh, that should be omega naught. I get some oscillation from this term here and I get some decay kappa from the decay of the cavity, okay? So that's the single particle response, a decaying oscillation signal. On another quantity that is often looked at yeah, is this Lorentzian spectral density that's defined as the imaginary part of the retarded Green's function in the frequency domain. And you really recognize here easily this Lorentzian function yeah, peaked around some omega naught with the width kappa. Yeah, so that's exactly what this function tells me. Now coming to the correlations, yeah, the cavity, let's look at the cavity mode occupation. Yeah. Now I can represent this occupation here as an anti-commutator at equal time. And I've told you previously that this anti-commutator is precisely really captured by the Keldish Green's function at equal time, t minus t. And if I take indeed the expression for this Keldish Green's function, which is this object here, and again, I ask you to, to verify this, then I get unity. So what that tells me is that the cavity, as I uh, go to large times, is empty. And that makes loads of sense yeah, if you consider that all I did here was looking at the decay of the loss of a single particle out of this cavity. So in summary of this lecture here, correlation properties are and statistical properties are encoded in this Keldish Green's function response or spectral properties in the retarded function. What comes next? Right. Next comes with focusing then now on the many body problem in this context and um, going from so to say the single cavity mode to uh, to many modes and come back essentially to this workhorse five fourth deadline uh, that we'll do then tomorrow. And you have a little bit of homework if I may ask you for, for this. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Sebastian. Great. So we, we can have some, go ahead, Kashra, you have questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if uh, there's a simple reason to see why, uh, you know, these kinds of, uh, you know, the ones of the, 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 type, the types of correlation functions that you defined, I mean, with you know fu functional integrals with respect to the classical quantum correspond to you know correlation functions or response functions is yeah. there a simple reason to see why it's true so, so can you can you, i mean what the what the question was really so so i i so should i go through again this is quantum and classical or no, no i i see how the derivation works but did, did you also mm -hmm. provide the reason why i mean maybe i missed it but did you provide the reason why? I mean, yeah, yeah, why the uh, you know the, the type of uh, functional derivatives that you actually made correspond to you know gr, let's say, and gk in these slides. Uh, yes. I mean, okay. that Going may be the definition, but yeah, that may be the definition of gr and gk. But why do they correspond to you know the response of a system or the correlation? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look at this. I mean, so so this here. I mean, first of all, I think it's useful to go back to the meaning of these variables. Yeah? So that, that's really where it's hidden. Yeah? That was somehow this, this argument here. So first one should note that, yeah, so that phi plus expectation value, yeah, if you look, and, and in physics, of course, you're not looking at single realizations of a field, but you're always looking at some average of it yeah? with respect to this fluctuating quantum theory that's underlying, right? And the statement is really this here. Yeah? If I look at, oh, sorry. <laughs> if I look at, so that should be a minus. If I look at expectation values, yeah, they cannot depend on this formal contour index. Yeah? This contour is in some sense a redundancy in the description yeah? because we are evolving this matrix, yeah? so L. But somehow, if, if it's unitary, it's very transparent. It's you and your dagger, but it's really the same evolution that's going on. 
Yeah? If it's lint Bladian, then it's, well, there's an L and L dagger. Yeah? But there cannot be, uh, the expectation values cannot depend on, on which side of the contour you evaluate that. Yeah? It's just redundant. So then this gives us immediately this idea that this phi C expectation value, yeah, that is just uh, this, uh, the, the sum, that can be non-zero possible. Yeah? So that gives us information about how this state is occupied, how this field mode is occupied really. Yeah? While this phi quantum for the same argument, for this argument here, that is clearly has to be zero. Yeah? So that gives us nothing interesting as a physical information. The occupation information is in here. Okay, so in that, now we are essentially at that stage. Yeah? So we would understand that if this phi C gives me occupation of this field mode phi, yeah? and now how do I compute that technically? Well, I see, ah, here is the coupling of this source, J quantum to phi C. Yeah? So I just take a derivative with respect to okay, this J star and I get down this field. So that's just the technical trick, okay? The next, now, and now I can branch in two directions. I can ask now, how do I get, for example, the occupation function of not only phi C times, but times phi C star. Yeah? For example, I want to know time T, how does that correlate with time T prime? Yeah? So then I have to go, I have to use another time, this JQ, and take another derivative so that this phi C comes down. Yeah. So whenever, let me put it even in, in this maybe a bit uh, simple-minded way, whenever you only see C indices, we are looking at an occupation type question. Yeah? That's what I mean. We are looking at what's the occupation, what's the probability for occupying this phi C, and at the same time phi C star, this one at time t in x, and this at t prime x prime. That's what it gives you. Yeah? And a particularly transparent limit is, I would say, yeah, when x equals t equals uh, x, uh, t equals t prime, x equals x prime, yeah, then by this relation to the operator, you see it's nothing but the occupation number of the state, of the single mode. Okay. Let me and now come finally back to, to this, to this retarded question. What does this mean here physically? Look at it like that. Yeah? So here, phi C, and this is still in the presence of some source J. Yeah? So here I have taken the first derivative and then I set J to zero, but I can write this, but this I can write it as phi for small j plus, and then something like phi c times phi q times j c, right? So that's uh, expanded at j equals zero plus higher order terms, right? Right. And then this thing here, I can write it, okay, first term plus, and here's a dt integration, c d prime. This is at t. And now I can, this here is not a fluctuating variable, this j. I can pull it out of the, uh, of the functional integral expectation value. dt prime phi c. Times. Okay. And now I should add some stars. <laughs> I have added the stars now in the wrong order, but th that's how they come about. Okay, so that's really the linear response is like the the the, the linear expansion in a in a in a wiggling field J C. Yeah? And and if you think about it, well, this object here is really nothing but the second variation first to J Q prime, uh, star and then to J C. Yeah, because jc couples to phi q star. 
that is what enters here. And that is somehow this object here is the second variational derivative of Z. The reason why you want to, you want variation with respect to JC is the same reason because JC is the is kind of physical and you know it's a it should be the same on the two contours. I mean the forward and backward. Contours. Right, right. That, that's very good, very good. Yeah. So so whenever yeah I have a, a classical field yeah so that with which I start to wiggle my quantum system yeah for example an electromagnetic field or some laser field yeah. So something like a J times A dagger plus J star A. Yeah, that would be, I mean, these are operators and that's an intense laser field. Yeah, so that could be its source. And whenever I think of a physical source, yeah, then I really think of this JC, yeah, which has the deci decisive feature that it doesn't have a contour independence and still is not uh, zero. Yeah? So any kind of classical time dependent variable, I will always represent it as a kind of this language classical field, JC. I see. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Let, let's have the last question because otherwise we, we, we need to preserve the break. Can I ask a yes. quick question? Can you comment on the case where uh, we have combination of boson and fermion? So let's say my Hamiltonian is fermionic, but the bath mm -hmm. is bosonic. Uh, yeah. Um, that is, uh, in that, I mean, there's one thing that you have to um, ask or to, to, to recall is what is called this fermionic super selection rule. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can have a coupling um, a times B, where uh, in terms of operators, yeah, plus where both of them are fermions, both of them are bosons, you cannot have this one. Yeah, this is violating the super selection rule that any meaningful, if you think about this as a contribution to a Hamiltonian operator, yeah, a Hamiltonian never changes the parity of a, a fermionic state. Yeah? That, that's a super selection rule, kind of axiomatic. Yeah? It has never been observed in nature. And that's why you rule out this fermion. So you cannot, in other words, you cannot create a fermion A from the vacuum, yeah? that would be a kind of bosonic classical drive that creates you a single fermion out of the vacuum. That is not possible. So in that sense, that this you have to rule it out. It's not specific to open systems. It's always true. Yeah? What you can have without any problem, if, if we design this here is the fermion and I couple this to a boson, that's easy, easily, realized. Yeah? So that's a kind of fermionic density coupling to a bosonic mode yeah? and then it would come in this way. That's, that's like a phonon coupling of a, of a fermion density to phonons where this occurs. Yeah? Yes, but, but the, the is, saying, uh, see, yeah. this has even fermion parity that's possible. Yeah, I was just thinking that should, should we just use simply a combination of the Grassmannian and this uh, coherent distance approach? How they kill this? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh -huh. your, your Fox space has a bosonic section and, and, and a fermionic section. Uh -huh. And you would re represent, I mean, for the fermions, you would use eta, yeah, this Grassmann. I see. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and, and the appropriate, uh, so to say, anti commutation rules. And for the bosons, yeah, you would use this. No problem. Yeah. You can, without, and again, I mean, this is, so to say, not specific to open system, closed system, not even to Keldish part in the growth. Yeah. I see. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, we have the last, but it has to be very short question. Uh, and I think we will try to start at 11.10 for the next time, for the next lecture. So you got, you got, did you have a question or any more? Very short. 
Yeah, so can this process be used to study quantum limit cycle, for example, in Van der Poel oscillator or Rayleigh Van der Poel oscillator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, uh, that's a, so these limiting cycles, yeah, as I see them, they are essentially emerging classical phenomena in a, a, on a quantum background. Yeah? So a necessary condition to have a really developed limit cycle is essentially the existence of some condensation, some mean field amplitude, yeah? which can then undergo some cyclic motion. Yeah? So if I would have to rank this in this, in this Keldish formulation, I would think of it like that. Yeah? So you have a, um, you have a, it has to do with the possibility of doing a semi-classical limit, yeah? e d phi, i s of phi. Yeah? So that's the full quantum problem, but under suitable, for example, in the presence of a condensation phenomenon, you can often forget about this whole summation here, and you can approximate it really by the classical action. Yeah? So where this here is a solution of the classical equation of motion for the action. This is really a kind of classical action, which can have limit cycles as you like, yeah, under appropriate non-equilibrium conditions. And then you could use this functional integral, for example, to study fluctuation corrections yeah, to, on, on top of this limit cycle. But my understanding of this limit cycles is really, you need some condensation phenomenon going on Condensation phenomenon always makes a problem classical in the same sense as a Bose condensation problem. Yeah, it has a large number of a largely occupied mode. Yeah, and it, for this mode, it doesn't matter if it's n or n plus one or n minus one. Yeah, so in that sense, it's classical. Yeah? It's not about is there n particles or n plus one or n minus one. In that sense, classical, and uh, it can still have phase coherence and everything. And that's the, the, the regime where you should look, where you should look for this uh, limit cycles. And then this is framework is a very suitable one. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian, very much for the nice lecture. So You're very welcome. May I uh, maybe ask? I mean, I can see it that I, I will by far not cover what I so that, that's okay. That's okay. It's okay. But can okay. I ask uh, what would be people more interested in this topology symmetry aspect or more in measurement uh, measurements and phase transitions measurements? Is that topology? Hmm? Topology is better. <laughs> topology. So, are there other uh, opinions? Measurement. Okay, so maybe we in the Discord, maybe we have a voting poll in the Discord and that we would be, that would be I, nice. will I, can, I mean, I would but, have need to the kind of because in that case I, I need to adjust a bit as of what I wanted to do. But uh, okay, okay let's discuss to... that break now and we can discuss this on Discord. Yes, because we need to so, let them risk for ah, them. Sorry, I don't want to keep you. <laughs> so we'll reconvene okay. at eleven we'll reconvene at eleven ten for June June Eve lecture. Mm -hmm. Talk Great. to you guys all. Talk to everyone later. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sebastian. I will. I will. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Mm -hmm.